boy. And we went to Stockton. And from Stockton, we marched to Sacramento and ended up when Caesar and ended up in Sacramento. When Caesar first started that march, there was about 87 farm workers. And they were the peregrinos. The pilgrimage is called the peregrinación. So those 87 members marched up and through, through Rich Grove, through Early Mart, all the way in through the Central Valley, Delano, Orange Cove, Sanger, all the different cities there uh, along the Highway 99 and inland. And when they arrived in Sacramento, because when we were in Stockton, I was amazed that there was probably now 2,000 people. And I was a young boy marching with my mom and my, my youngest sister was in a, um, in a stroller. And I remember that was the first time that I realized the impact that Caesar was having on the rights of farm workers and the recognition that people were giving him because of his commitment in the struggle to help farm workers. When we're walking down Highway 99, and I hear, si se puede. And you know, as a little boy, 2,000 people was a long line. And we were probably about in the middle, and I could hear, si se puede up there. And then turn around, si se puede. And it seemed like, as far as my eyes could see, there were people. And they were all supporting Caesar and the Lord's Huerta, and the farm workers, and the struggle. So then I thought, wow, that's amazing. That guy's my uncle, it's my deal. And they're saying his name, Viva Cesar Chavez! Si se puede! Huelga! Huelga! And I'm like, wow, this is awesome. But the thing about Caesar is that he was such a humble person. He was such a humble man and didn't really want recognition, didn't want accolades, didn't want kudos, didn't want celebrations on his behalf. Just even now, in his passing, if he were here with me today, he would say, don't fill libraries or name streets or have, you know, different parks named after me. What I would want you to do is I would want you to continue to be involved in your own community. Be involved in education. And by God, you're all involved in education, whether you like it or not. And I'm so proud of you to be here. But Caesar would have liked that. As a matter of fact, during the summer times, as I got older, we'd go help during the summer and help with the boycotts, help with the strikes, help with getting donations. And there were college students just like some of you, who would come to Delano and they would enter in as volunteers and work all summer doing the same thing, organizing, being, uh, gathering donations, doing all the things that all of the other staff members did. And at the end of the summer, it was about time for them to go back. And there were several that told Caesar, we want to work with you full time. We want, we love, and we believe in this struggle and your commitment, and we're committed too. So we want to be hired on full time. At that time, you got hired with the United Farm Workers. You got, well, it started off at five dollars a week in room and board, and then I would say in the early 70s, it was then ten dollars a week that you got plus your report. So you never went without some shelter, you never went without food to eat. But you really worked your tails off. So these students would say, we want to work full time. And Caesar said, no, you can't. What? We didn't do a good job this summer? No, you did an excellent job. You don't think we're committed? No, you're committed. You don't think we sacrificed enough? No, you sacrificed enough. But your goal should be to finish college, to be a doctor, to be a professor, to be a lawyer, to be a 
a law enforcement, to be whatever your goals are. You go do that, and you go back to college, and when you get your degree, and you want to come back full time, you can come back full time and work with us. And some did. He said, but if you don't come back and work with us full time, you will help us in every city that you live in. And you will be part of our, our community outreach program. You can head that up in your different cities. And so the students were like, oh, he doesn't want our help. No, he wanted your help. But he knew there were various different ways that you could help in the farm worker movement. The front line was absolutely always necessary. But you know, the strength of the boycott, the great boycott, really came when he sent out those frontline workers to different cities. And some of the workers had never even been outside of Delano. And they were sent to Chicago, they were sent to Wisconsin, cities in Wisconsin, New York, Canada, all over the United States. And they learned to organize and to really help that boycott because of the efforts that they did. You know, Caesar had three main principles. Nonviolence, public action, and volunteerism. So we all know about nonviolence. And nonviolence is one of the most, nowadays even most difficult things to do. It takes all of your inner strength to be nonviolent. It takes all of your inner strength, as his mom taught him, to turn the other cheek. Our visceral reaction is always to respond. But it's in the internal fortitude that you have in your heart and soul that makes nonviolence work. Public action. Public act. Getting involved in registering people to vote. Getting involved in the boycott. Taking what you have as an individual and putting it out to that community that you know and live and serve. And the way you do that is through volunteerism. You know, that's why Caesar didn't pay very much money. Because he wanted the people that were working with him, the staff, to understand the struggle of farm workers. And back in the 60s, the struggle was extremely difficult. And the ironic thing, that hasn't changed that much. It's still extremely difficult. They still have a continuous amount of discrimination. They still have an uh, extreme amount of low wages, no health care. You know, Caesar fought and, and finally accomplished the only law, the only law in the United States that protects farm workers. And it came with the help of just our last former governor, Jerry Brown, in 1975. If they passed the Agriculture Labor Relations Board, Agriculture Labor Relations Act. And then they created the Agriculture Labor Relations Board. And in theory, that was supposed to help. Well, after Jerry Brown left, we had a succession of many different governors that really didn't apply the law. But the two good things that came out of that law, well, several, but one was that there were now restrooms in the fields. Restrooms in the fields. You think that's pretty basic, but back even when my mother and my aunts and uncles were working in the fields, there were no restrooms. So if you're working tomatoes, the plants are only about this tall. So how do you hide behind a plant to go to the bathroom? Men would be kind of different. They could run someplace to go hide. But for women, it was extremely difficult. It was embarrassing. And what they had to do is the women would get together and they would form a circle. And then the woman that had to go to the restroom would be in the middle of the circle. Now, that in itself, even with women around you, is embarrassing. So, bathrooms, 1975. Water. People think, oh, there should always be water. No, there wasn't. 
and the water that was there, they had to drink from from the from the ditches, from the irrigation ditches. Well, pesticides, and Caesar really promoted the elimination of pesticides, where it was always in the drinking water. So if you didn't have your own water to drink, you were drinking that water, which is not good, not healthy. And it hadn't been good and healthy for a long time. The other thing that he was able to get is the consideration for uh, unemployment insurance. But that was a struggle that took a lot longer. That law helped, but it took a lot longer. It wasn't until even just a little over a year ago that farm workers now have overtime. Never had overtime before. You can work in the field for 13 hours, 16 hours. They would still pay you that minimum wage, whatever that might be. So, in those early days, it was a, it was a, a big struggle. The thing that was uplifting was having the volunteers that came out to help. And that continued volunteerism was what kept the union going. You know, Caesar had a lot of opportunities prior to starting the farm worker movement to be in a position with the community service organization. Now that was where he first started his social justice and organizing. Fred Ross, as you probably hear and see in the history books, was the person that had got him going. And he started in a little area in San Jose called San Cipuedo. Get out if you can. The reason why they called it San Cipuedo is because it was just a dirt road with a lot of uh, potholes. And when it rained, it got really, really muddy. And literally, it was difficult to drive or even walk out of that neighborhood. And that's why they called it San Cipuedo. But that's where he started his organizing efforts. San Jose, California. It wasn't Delano, it wasn't Sacramento, it wasn't anywhere else but San Jose, California. <laughs> that's the significance of, of San Jose. But he later became not just an organizer, but then he became a state coordinator, and they wanted him to become the national coordinator of the community service organization, which really started in Los Angeles and then spread throughout California and all the various states. And so they were going to give him this a good paying job. But he said, I think we should start helping farm workers. And the board of directors of the CSO said, no, 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 we are a community-based organization. We don't want to go to the rural areas. We don't want to chase farm workers because they're always moving from crop to crop. And there's never a central location that we can meet with them. He said, well, there is. You meet with them in their homes. You go to their homes and have them invite friends. That was the beginning of what we call a house meeting. So I would tell Frank to go and invite five friends. And then I'll meet them at 7 o'clock and we'll have a meeting. And we'll talk about organizing the West Valley College teachers. Oh, shoot, they're already organized. I'm sorry. <laughs> but they would talk about organizing wherever they were at. And that's how he did it. Well, the CSO said, no, we want you to be the national director. He said, no, I won't do that unless we organize farm workers. So they said, no, we're not going to do that. So he said, okay, I'm going to go do it on my own. And he did. He left what would have been a well-paying job, I think, don't quote me on this, but I think they were going to offer them $35,000 a year in 1964. A lot of money there, right? And he said, no. I'm going to start this union. So we went and talked to several people. One of the unique things about being in the family is that my mother is the oldest sibling of the Chavez family. And uh, she's still alive today, 93 years old. We just celebrated her 93rd birthday in August. Anyway, yeah. And she 
she wasn't so tired from this weekend, I was going to try and convince her to come over. <laughs> she's been here. But she's really, really busy all the time. She's so, has so much energy. I call her that energizer bunny, you know. Just keeps on going and going and going. Doesn't stop. But anyway, Caesar would always come to my mother's house, to Rita's house, and talk to, him, talk to her about what his plans were. She was his confidant. So whenever there was anything going on, whether it was good news or bad news, and he needed to bounce it off somebody, he would come to our house. And that was an exceptional experience for me because I was usually there. What was not so exceptional is that as he was developing the farm workers and the union and getting supporters, he'd come to my house and they would have meetings. And the meetings would start at 7 o'clock and end at 9, sometimes 10 o'clock at night. Well, we live in downtown San Jose in a two-bedroom, one-bath house. I had five sisters, actually four at the time. And my bedroom was the living room. <laughs> I used to sleep on the couch. And that's where he would have the meetings. So that meant that I couldn't go to sleep at 8.30 or 9 or 9.30. So what I would do is I'd go to our little dining room and I'd line up the chairs. And that was my bed. And it wasn't too bad once, twice. After the 20th time, I was like, hey, Mom, why does Phil Caesar always have that meeting here at our house? You know, I'm getting tired of sleeping on the chair. Said, it's okay, Mijo. It's okay. Someday, you'll look back, and you'll know that you were part of organizing farm workers. I want to organize farm workers. I'll have you, little boy. <laughs> but later on, and even today, I can reflect back, sleeping on those chairs in the, in the dining room. And I can think, yeah, that's my contribution to the movement. <laughs> So Caesar started farm work. Met this woman in Stockton, California, who was a teacher named Dolores Huerta. Have you ever heard of Dolores Huerta? <laughs> Today, Dolores Huerta still travels and speaks and runs her own foundation for social justice and education for those that are underprivileged. So he meets the Lourdes Huerta and they start the United Farm, they started the Farm Worker, National Farm Worker Association, NFWA. They had a whopping $62.50 in the bank after two months of collecting money. Then on September 16th, there was a call to the union from a group of Filipino farm workers that developed and organized an association called AWOP. They asked Caesar and Dolores to join the strike of Filipino workers, big strike in Delano and the surrounding area. And Caesar thought, wow, we, we can't afford to do that. You know, we don't even have enough money in our, in our bank account. But he knew then that it was important to be unified with the Filipino farm workers and so on that day, they had a meet, general meeting, and everyone voted uh, thank you, to, to join the Filipino farm workers. That wasn't me, I swear to God. <laughs> so Caesar was trying to tell me, be quiet. We're almost done. So, the other good thing that Caesar used to do was build coalitions and alliances. And he did it with other unions. He did it with uh, other organizations, other community-based organizations. And he did it with individuals. And that's how the strength of the farm worker movement continued to build. And it's still building today. In 1993, on April 23rd, Caesar passed away 
in Arizona. Yuma, Arizona, not very far from where he was born near the Gila Valley. And people always ask, well, what did he die of? You know, was he poisoned? Was, uh, was he beat? What happened? Well, Caesar, in his lifetime, had three major fasts. The first one was for 24 days, the second was 25, and the last one was 36 days. And in each fast, he had a purpose for the fast. It wasn't a hunger strike, so there's a difference between a fast and a hunger strike. He was protesting violence in the field. He, in his last fast, he protested the use of pesticides. And he said, this fast is an internal offering, an internal sacrifice. And it's my way of showing the workers and the community how committed I am to these issues. So, when he passed away, the family, well, in Arizona they did an autopsy, but we did our own autopsy once we received uh, his remains. And, and in both cases, the physicians, the medical examiners, were amazed at the strength and the size and the, I guess the, the condition that his heart was in. Even after all those fasts, even after all that suffering, his heart at 66 years old was compared to a person whose heart was 40, 42 years old. His lungs were strong, his heart was good. He had some scarring in his uh, liver and kidney from just drinking water for all those days. But everything else in his internal organs was in really good shape. Part of that comes from his father, my grandfather, had longevity in his genes. He passed away at 101. My grandmother passed away at 99 and a half. My mother currently is 93, and I'll be 65 in May, so if I get to be like 75, I'll be good. If I get to be 95, I'll have a party, you're all invited. But Caesar died of a natural cause. He was getting ready to testify in a court case in Arizona the next morning. And he was reading a magazine about the indigenous people of all, throughout the world, in Mexico and all the other different countries. And when they found him the next morning, he still had the magazine in his hand, and he was slightly turned, his head was turned towards the window, and those that discovered his body, David Martinez, who was the Secretary Treasurer of the Union at the time, walked in because he was trying to wake him up, get him ready for the testimony. And he says he walked in, and it was almost as, as if Caesar had a little smile on his face. And, you know, nobody thought to capture that moment. But it's in the moment of, of their heart and soul of all the, you know, executive board members that were there that morning. So, Caesar passes away. The United Farm Workers is in flux. They had to figure out, what are we going to do now? Well, Caesar's daughter was married to a gentleman named Arturo Rodriguez who was on the executive board, he was an executive vice president. The board got together and named him Caesar's successor. And Arturo did a great job of continuing the Caesar Chavez legacy up and until this last December, after 25 years, he retired. And now they have a new 
president. And it's a woman. And her name is Teresa. I can't remember last name. She's an attorney. She was on the executive board. And she's carrying on Caesar's legacy. Caesar always believed in equality. He always believed in diversity. So it wasn't just a, uh, an all-male executive board. I mean, it couldn't have been. It started off with Dolores Huerta, right? And there were several other women that were on the executive board over like, these last 50 years or so. So it's almost fitting that now the new president is a woman, a powerful woman, an attorney, smart, committed, all those things that make a good president, which we have one sitting in the front row, ATF. It's important for people to know and understand how diversity and inclusion work. And Caesar was always a promoter of that in everything that he did. It was never all men. It was never just us, patos, you know. It was always la gente. And women are part of la gente. I was really fortunate as uh, you heard some of the jobs that I had. Somehow or another, I had staff and the majority of them were women. And it wasn't necessarily because I had five sisters and they controlled me. <laughs> but I found that women are very good collaborators. Most of the women that I work with are extremely intelligent, extremely diverse, extremely talented, and absolutely committed to the field that they were working in, in labor relations. So, that's a, that's a, that was an important factor, an important element, an important character that sometimes people forget about Caesar is inclusion, equality, equity, and diversity. But that's the way he lived his life. Because he just wasn't a farm worker advocate. He was a social justice advocate. He was involved in supporting the women's movement when it first came out. He was involved in helping uh, the uh, gay rights movement when it first came out. He was a supporter of all those social efforts that sometimes people take for granted. But they are key components of Jesus' legacy. So those are the things that, that we also, as uh, members of the organization and members of the family, that we also try to promote. Because that's also part of Jesus' legacy. He was nonviolent. He was a vegetarian. More, almost a total vegan, loved to do uh, yoga, always meditated. And the one thing he really did that was always impressive of me, or I was, in, was impressed by him, was he read. You know, when he was young, he had to stop working in the, start working in the fields to help support the family. So he only had an eighth grade education. But, he was able to achieve everything that he was able to accomplish through reading books. I remember as a young boy, I always saw him carrying a book. And if he wasn't carrying a book, whenever he rode from one place to another, he had the book next to him in the car that he was driving. Always had a book. 